about deployment and use of XRO9 in free software components. The talk picks up cover a little bit about myself, about the motivation for the free software cookbook I started reporting on. Uh, I'll talk about some of my uh, experiences with deploying X509 infrastructure, uh, about use of X509 certificates in services, and uh, I will also discuss some of my conclusions as uh, to working with free software solutions in the area of X509. We will also leave some time for the question and answers session. So, a little bit about myself. First of all, I used to have hair, a lot of it. So, this was before I started dealing with system administration in PTM. <laughs> if you've got still some hair, just get off the train as soon as you can. I come from Belgrade, Serbia. I'm a system administrator, system integrator. And uh, I also do a little bit of programming, but uh, only, only free software. Uh, and I'm a big free software supporter. I try to use free software whenever it's possible. And uh, I have uh, a great interest in PKI. So, motivation for the cookbook. Uh, what I wanted was to deploy a completely free software solution that would uh, encompass the X509 infrastructure including uh, services like Certification Authority, OCSP Responder, CRL Distribution Points, and uh, Certificate Repositories. Uh, then I wanted to deploy uh, X109 in services uh, using uh, certificates for both authentication and authorization uh, in services like uh, mail, IMAP, SMTP, VPNs, web servers, anything that I can think of. Uh, I want also wanted to do it enterprise style. Uh, basically, I wanted to deploy a solution that can compete with some of the proprietary products, like coming from IBM and uh, similar companies. So, on to the X509 infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure is, uh, the, the certification authorities I work with is basically just EGBCA, and of course some of the OpenSSL uh, in client, uh, as a client utility. <coughs> So, some of the requirements for the EGPCA, uh, you would need a JDK 6. You'll need the JBoss, for example, JBoss Application Server 510 GA. Uh, and you will need the database. Uh, the database I prefer are MySQL and PostgreSQL. Of course, EGPCA can uh, work with uh, other types of databases as well, including the uh, built in uh, uh, database. So, some of the interesting parts, as I was deploying EGBCA, was that basically you have a bootstrap process when you're deploying EGBCA. Uh, since EGBCA itself depends uh, on use of certificates for web administration and for setting it up, uh, you have a chicken and egg problem. So, the bootstrap process helps you to actually set up an initial hierarchy to deploy an administration certification authority, which can then issue key stores, trust stores, and super administration certificates. And uh, afterwards, you want to set up uh, uh, certificate profiles, which basically uh, cover uh, all the technical details related to certificate usages and some of the technical stuff, like uh, the OC experience folder URL, like uh, serial distribution locations, and uh, key sizes, stuff like that. And finally, you, you, de you, de uh, you define the identity profiles. And then the profiles actually de determine what's uh, the contents of a certificate, like uh, what's in subject of certificate, what's in subject alternative name. Uh, also, at some point you might want to actually uh, migrate your uh, temporary hierarchy. You might actually want to uh, have EGBC using the new uh, certification authority hierarchy you deployed, like root uh, certification authority, maybe you will have a, a server certification authority, and uh, you will want to migrate the EGBC itself to this hierarchy. So you will need to issue a new key store, you will need to issue new trust stores, and you will need to issue new super administration uh, credentials. 
you also need to set up PGBCA to actually recognize these new credentials. Uh, the critical uh, thing is that you can find yourself locked out of the system. Uh, at one point, it happened to me <coughs> that uh, I've marked a certain certificate uh, uh, extension as critical, and uh, Mozilla Firefox wasn't able to process it. And I didn't back up uh, the old key store, the old trust store in the process. So, for example, you, can, uh, you want to be careful when you're defining certificate profiles. Uh, onto the positive stuff about EGBCA, there's plenty of options and it's very well documented. Uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, inline comments uh, in the configuration files and uh, you have uh, quite a decent user manual administration manual and everything that you need. On the negative side, um, currently it has quite a clunky web interface. Uh, the web interface is currently a work in progress, so uh, there will be some <coughs> improvements in this area. And uh, it actually lacks use of client certificate um, authentication for authenticating to some of the external services. For example, if you want to push uh, certificates into an L LDAP uh, directory, uh, it can only support use of uh, username and password. Uh, you also want to pay attention when you're picking uh, the JDK you want to be running. Uh, Oracle JDK, in my view, sucks a little. Uh, if, you have, if you're trying to deploy any kind of uh, test system with uh, small virtual machines, you will actually face uh, that Oracle JDK has quite huge memory consumption uh, in its default configuration. Uh, you also have the JC policy uh, stuff, which basically means that uh, during any upgrade of JDK, you must pay attention that you have uh, replaced the default JCA policy uh, in, uh, in the Oracle JDK. Or if you don't do that, basically things start falling apart. Uh, in case of Open JDK or IST, uh, a number of times I've seen people having problem with the JavaScript support, me included. Uh, basically, Open JDK, IST uh, use the Rhino project. And uh, some distributions actually might not include JavaScript support in the JDK, in the IST or Open JDK. For example, if you're using a Gento system and you try to install the IST binary package, you will lack support for the JavaScript. And uh, ant targets, which are used for uh, deploying the GPCA, will fail because of that. Now, onto the OCSP responder, I'll use the GPC again. It has basically the same requirements uh, as in case of setting up certification authority. Some <coughs> of the highlights. Uh, you will need to define a separate OCSP certificate profile. Well, you will want to uh, designate uh, extended key usage OCSP signer so that actually uh, you can use the OCSP responder. Uh, you will also need to provide OC OCSP key stores. Uh, you deploy key stores in uh, one OCSP, OCSP key store per certification authority in PKCS 12 format. Uh, and uh, the important thing that you must remember is that uh, passwords across, across those PKCS 12 files must all match. Uh, because you can only provide a single password uh, when you're deploying uh, OCSP. Uh, in case of EGBC, and when you're deploying OCSP, you provide a single password for the key stores. Uh, <coughs> you will also need to sy synchronize the initial OCSP database by hand. Now, the thing is that Essentially, a part of uh, EGBC certification authority database is actually kept at the OCSP responder. So any information about certificates and their validity is actually kept uh, in the unchanged form on the OCSP, uh, uh, OCSP responder database. So this manual synchronization actually includes uh, dumping the database and importing, importing it on another server. Uh, and you will want to, of course, you will need to set up an automatic publisher so that uh, whenever uh, some certificate gets revoked or gets uh, issued, it, will it should automatically be pushed into the OCSP da database. Uh, EGBC has support for actually making uh, publishing queues. So if for some reason you are unable to publish a certificate to the OCSP database, uh, you may set up uh, services which will periodically retry uh, that stuff. 
the good things <coughs> with using eGPC is that o OCSP is that uh, it's easy to deploy. It's much easier to deploy than certification authority, of course. Uh, it's easy to maintain because it's easy to understand. I mean, basically, you have just a copy copy of a, uh, of a single of one or two tables from the eGPC certification authority onto the OCSP responder. So you can actually uh, easily debug some of the problems. Uh, if you are a little bit versed with the SQL, you can perform a, custom queries to figure out uh, what's happening with some certificate. And it pretty much works as advertised. I haven't seen uh, any problems using this as OCSP responder. Uh, except that the initial database synchronization feels a bit clunky uh, because you need to, um, to manually synchronize it. Uh, it would be probably a good idea to actually have a command line interface which would perform this operation for you uh, since all the information about the OCSP database, like credentials, usernames, uh, are already present in the configuration files. Next in line is serial distribution point. Uh, I've concentrated myself mostly on using a web server because that's just the simplest way that you can distribute CRLs. And uh, you can use any kind of web server, Apache, Nginx, Lite, HTTP, there's, not, there's really not much to it, you're just serving files. And uh, you will need to use some kind of file transfer uh, method, like using SVTP, SCP, FTP, anything you uh, prefer. <coughs> you will, uh, EGPC supports custom serial publishers. That means that you can actually write your own binary or script, which will be publishing the CRLs anywhere, or doing anything with those CRLs at all. Uh, it, it should receive a single argument, and that's a path to a there encoded CRL file. Uh, the good thing is, uh, once you deploy this script, you need to set up custom CRL publisher, and you will need to assign this CRL publisher to a number of different certification authorities. Of course, you can have uh, multiple publishers which are pushing uh, uh, CRLs to different servers depending on which uh, certification authority you are processing. <coughs> the positive thing is that this kind of scam is very, very flexible because uh, you can use, for example, uh, processing of CRL contents. So if you define some kind of uh, hierarchy between uh, the issuer of a CRL and uh, the location that the CRL can be found, you can actually automate this. If you have like uh, CRL.example.com uh, slash country slash location, you can actually extract this information using a simple script and automatically uh, create a destination path. Uh, you can also use any protocol that you like for file transfer, which, is, uh, which allows you uh, quite a bit of flexibility. And of course, you can use any programming language or scripting language uh, which can be executed on the certification authority side. Uh, the negative thing is only that maybe CRL is always provided in their format, so you can't tell uh, EGBC to provide it in their format, but of course, if you need PEM, you can easily, easily convert uh, the initial uh, CRL using like SSL uh, command line utility. Uh, when it comes down to certificate repositories, I've used OpenLDAP, and uh, OpenLDAP is uh, sufficient <coughs> just for itself, when, for, for what I've used it. Uh, basically, I wanted to have uh, all the client certificates stored in the LDAP uh, database so that users can fetch those certificates for uh, encryption purposes. Uh, the important aspect uh, of deploying OpenLDAP and using EGBC with it is uh, generally to have a good certificate subject distinguished name mapping. Every entry in an LDAP uh, tree has a distinguished name which uniquely identifies it. Uh, if you have a good uh, hierarchy set up, you can actually perform more or less one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, you can set up, uh, when you're setting LDAP publisher, you have uh, two options. You can set up the plain LDAP publisher, uh, which basically specify a base distinguished name, like uh, DC equals people, DC equals example, DC equals com. 
and uh, then you just select the attribute from certificate to be used for mapping. So if you're uh, depending on uh, user ID, you can actually tell it, okay, use your user ID, and you end up with something like UID equals Branco, uh, DC equals people's DC equals example, DC equals com. Uh, it's also possible to use the Yellow Search Publisher, which uh, allows you to perform this mapping through your own LDAP query. So if you do not have the uh, one to one mapping uh, like the one I described, you can actually specify a custom LDAP query that will be executed to figure out the destination distinguished name where the certificate sh should be stored at. Uh, I have this uh, in one case where uh, there was a requirement that the certific that certificate uh, should hold a personal number. And uh, I needed the, uh, it was stored in the user ID field, in UID, uh, unique ID. But uh, I wanted to use that same field for the username. So I had a small conflict, uh, which I resolved by providing, uh, I, I've used, uh, didn't want to extend the LOP scanner. So I used the employee number field in the LDAP and actually tried to figure out what was the destination uh, disti uh, destination DN uh, by performing that search. The positive thing is that uh, using open LDAP for this is it's quite flexible. Uh, depending on the structure of certification authorities you, you, set, you set up, uh, you can create custom la layouts and everything. And you can integrate it into existing LDAP tree. So if your organization already has an LDAP tree, uh, you can, to most people, in seamlessly integrate storing uh, users' uh, encryption certificates in LDAP tree. Uh, of course, uh, still the important thing is uh, the actual <coughs> mapping. The negative thing is uh, that, uh, as I said before, you can't use client certificates for authenticating against the open LDAP server. And uh, there was a, currently there's a small republishing bug that's present. Uh, if you are attempting to publish certificates that, ha that have already been stored in the LDAP directory, uh, you will, um, in LDAP, you must, between a single distinguished name, you must have a unique uh, key value uh, combination. That pair must be completely unique. Uh, and uh, EGPC is currently not processing that step. But the good thing is that there is a patch pending. Uh, I've actually written that patch. I'm not a Java developer, but I've managed to uh, put something together. And uh, the, the good thing is also that there are actually two more uh, alternative uh, solutions uh, to the patch I created to this bug. Now, moving on to the smart cards. Uh, well, for smart cards, you, if you want to use it for any kind of uh, signing operation, for system authentication, for uh, signing emails, encrypting emails. Uh, you will uh, uh, need smart card reader. You will need PCSC Lite to communicate uh, with smart card reader and the smart card itself. You will need, for example, CCID, uh, but that's driver for CCID compliant readers. And in most cases, you actually want to target a fully compliant CCID uh, smart card reader. Uh, there are some cases like uh, on the key or current here, which uh, which are kind of semi CCID compliant. Uh, as long as you don't use the extended APTU commands, it all works okay. So uh, the moment you start using ex extended APTU commands, uh, it starts to fail, uh, which happens usually if you use uh, a bit larger keys for uh, when generating larger keys on the, the smart card. Um, and the, the important thing to, uh, okay, you will need also a PKCS 11 provider. That's what I've used. Uh, OpenSC project uh, supports a number of, diff of different cards. And uh, the important thing is to keep in mind that you might need different uh, software versions depending on uh, which kind of smart card or smart card reader you have selected. Uh, so it can be a bit troubling. Now, well, to some the pilot when it comes out to using smart cards, usually you first erase the card, uh, then you initialize the PK, PKCS 15 structures on it, 
uh, then you might, at your option, create additional user pin codes. Like uh, you can have a different user pin uh, protecting the signing certificate and encryption certificate. Uh, afterwards, you want to generate keys on the smart card, use that key to generate a certificate signing request, use the certificate signing request to obtain a certificate from the certification authority, and uh, then you store the, this client certificate on the smart card. The good thing about smart cards, uh, I will mention some of the cards I worked with. So Aventra My EID, uh, it has a feature which is called Security Officer. Uh, when you are initializing Aventra My EID, you can specify Security offer, Officer pin code. Security Officer, uh, it's kind of user management. So like you have Security Officer, you have User, in case of smart cards. Security Officer uh, is a person, is an entity which is allowed to do anything to the card. So once the card has been created, the initials and everything, uh, only the security officer is uh, allowed to erase the card or uh, perform some of the other operations. While the user is still, of course, entitled to regular use of smart cards. Uh, there is, it also has support fi for finalization, uh, which requires the security officer support. Finalization is a process basically when you tell a uh, smart card to lock itself down so that only a security officer can perform some uh, of the more sensitive operations. Uh, and the good thing about Aventure My EID is that it supports multiple user spins or slots. So that's one of the cases where you can actually define uh, different pin codes for encryption and signing uh, certificates. Uh, there's also efficient PKI and EPAS 2003. Uh, the nice thing is that there are free kits available from GUZEU. So if you're actually uh, intent to develop and somehow support uh, use of PKCS 11 and use of smart cards and free software, you can uh, get um, a free token from GUZEU. And uh, there's a lot of tools for working with smart cards, primarily coming from the OpenSC project. Uh, for mani manipulating the PKCS 15 structures or working with PKCS 11 libraries. Uh, and of course, there's a continued effort to support more and more cards. The negative thing is that uh, in case of Fusion PKI and EPAS 2003, it doesn't have uh, security officer support and uh, it doesn't support finalization. Uh, finalization depends on the security officer support and both of these uh, items are actually work in progress. Uh, another, well, flaw is that it doesn't, it, it's not maybe a fault, but it uh, supports just a single user pin code. Uh, one of the flaws is also that you might need to recompile OpenSC PKCS 11 provider and the library itself uh, in case of newer cards, uh, which can be a little bit distribution friendly. Uh, because you will need to be mixing different versions from, uh, in my case, I had to backport some of the packages from the Debian testing onto the Debian squeeze. Uh, a nice idea would be probably to have some kind of uh, modular runtime support you would, where you would simply provide uh, a module for a certain card which the OpenSC PKCS learning providers will simply load at the runtime depending on its needs. Uh, there's also a big lack of user-friendly documentation. It is very hard to get uh, starting working with smart cards, uh, both in case of development and integration. So that's that's an another issue I've run into. Now moving on to the use of uh, X59 in uh, services, I will first talk a little bit uh, about the system authentication using the PAM PKCS11 model. Uh, you will need, of course, a smart card reader, smart card, PCSC Lite for communicating with both of those, and a PKCS 11 provider. I use the OpenSC. And, uh, of course, what you need to define is first the trust anchor. Uh, you can provide it in one of two ways. You can either provide a single file in PEM format, base 64 encoded, or you can provide an OpenSL style cache to directory. Uh, in case of Sierra, you also can provide a single PAM file or you can use the OpenSL style cache directory. Uh, then you need to define the 
verification checks that the PAM PKCS alone should perform. Uh, PAM PKCS alone supports a number of different verification steps, like uh, it can, of course, uh, validate the chain of trust, it can validate uh, the signature, so it can actually request from the user to enter PIN code and uh, to sign something with the uh, smart card to verify that the present certificate is uh, really in uh, correlation with the private key stored in the smart card. And uh, it can perform uh, CRL checks. It supports three modes for CRL checks, offline, online, and automatic. Uh, offline is when you simply download CRLs to some predefined directory and tell it to read CRLs from there. Uh, online uh, allows PMPKCS11 to extract the CRL distribution point from the certificate and download the, the CRL and uh, validate the certificate using that downloaded CRL. And automatic is basically a fallback mode. First try the online. If online fails, go to the offline mode. Uh, it also supports multiple checks, of course. You can define all, all these three uh, types of checks or you can exclude one of those checks is quite useful if you're trying to actually uh, figure out uh, some kind of bug or uh, if you're trying to figure out in which validation steps uh, PAM PKCS11 fails. Uh, no OCSP support? We'll get to that in two slides, <laughs> actually. So first thing about PAM PKCS11, <laughs> it's uh, easy to set up. Uh, it comes in with a well-documented uh, example configuration file and it has support for CRLs. The bad thing is that, uh, but this is not really related to PAM PKCS11, but the problem is that login is not event-driven, so uh, it's not possible to detect smart card insertion. Uh, usually you must initiate uh, the login process yourself, so you will either provide the username or uh, you will um, actually have to, uh, <coughs> you, you, or you would enter uh, space uh, and let the PAM PKCS11 extract the username automatically from certificate. Uh, and of course, something that uh, you will hear a lot as I'm talking about services is no OCSP support. Next on, on to the OpenVPN. Uh, <coughs> you can deploy OpenVPN using uh, X509 certificates in two variants. Uh, you can use a soft token, and for that you just need the, the OpenVPN itself. And of course you can use uh, smart card, and you will need smart card reader, uh, smart card, PCS Lite, PKCS Lite provider. <coughs> when it comes down uh, to configuration uh, of use of soft or hard tokens, uh, in case of soft token, you provide a certificate in PEM format. Um, certificate uh, in, in, PEM in PEM format file. And uh, this file should include the full trust hierarchy, like all the root and the intermediary, intermediary certificates between. And you will need to provide a private key also in PEM format. Uh, if you're using the smart card, you are providing, you are telling it which PKCS11 provider, which library to use. Uh, and you need to pro provide something that's called certificate serialized ID. Uh, I'll get this a bit, l uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it later. And uh, you need to provide uh, the Helman parameters in PEM format uh, generated using OpenSL. That's required just for the server. Okay, so there are two modes of uh, configurations which you can use for OpenVPN. Uh, one is providing uh, trust chi chain in a single uh, file in PEM format. It should include both the root and the intermediary certification authority certificates. Uh, and uh, you can provide optionally in this configuration CRL. Uh, the catch is that you must provide only a single CRL, uh, which should target the end entities which are connecting to the OpenVPN server, or vice versa. Uh, the servers to which the OpenVPN clients are connected. Uh, of course, the problem is that you can't validate the intermediary certificates. Uh, the second variation uh, provides uh, support for OpenSSL style hash directory, and uh, you need to specify all the certification authority certificates in this directory, have them downloaded there, 
and have all the CRLs in there, and that's actually mandatory. The good thing uh, when you're using OpenVPN is that it's one of uh, rare pieces of software that actually encourages <coughs> client uh, use of client certificates for authentication authorization. Uh, it's actually uh, necessary to explicitly disable uh, the client certificate use in, in case of OpenVPN, so it's not the default option. Uh, it supports use of CRLs, uh, it supports use of PKCS11, and uh, in case of variant one for configuration, uh, it will reload CRL every time. So you can uh, download the new CRL in the background and it will automatically pick it up. Uh, in case of the second configuration, uh, it will check all the CRLs. It will check both the intermediary and identity ones. Now, the problem. Uh, configuration variant one, of course, you can provide just a single CRL. But configuration variant two is a bit more problematic. Uh, if you have uh, an open S OpenSL style uh, hash directory, uh, you will actually need to restart the entire OpenVPN server to uh, reload, reload the CRLs, which basically means that you are cutting connections to all the connected clients. Uh, its use of smart card is also a bit uh, poorly implemented. Uh, you have the serialized certificate ID, which is a very uh, ugly piece of identifier, and you must provide it and you are unable to actually tell it, you know, use the first uh, slot which contains a certificate uh, with digital signature key usage, extended key usage. And of course, it has uh, no OCSP support. Uh, in case of IMAP servers, I've concentrated on Dolcut. Uh, I've had a quick look at Cyrus IMAP as well, but from what I can tell, it doesn't really support um, use of client certificates just for the ju just the use of client certificates for authentication. Uh, you don't need anything else beyond Docker to compile with uh, necessary support. Uh, you will need to provide on the server side uh, you need to provide server, server certificate in PAM format. Uh, which should, should include the root certification authority and intermediary certification authority certificates. And you need to provide private key in PEM format as well. And uh, this is the catchy part. Uh, you need to provide the trust chain in PEM format. But the format of this file requires that you store both CRLs and certification authority certificates in a single file. So you should have, for example, root CRE certificate followed by the CRL, intermediate CA certificate, followed by its CRL. It's really not, not a good choice. <coughs> now, an interesting thing about Docker is that it can, it can determine the location of mail directory of that user using uh, its username. So, for example, let's say that username is username at example.com. You can actually tell it, okay, use this static part, slash bar slash female, uh, then use the domain, then use the username. This is very useful if you want to have uh, multiple domains supported on the same server. And uh, it also eases uh, the deployment by... Uh, you, you can simply have virtual users, which is very nice. Uh, Docker supports extraction of username from certificates, but it can use uh, any field from the certificate subject. Uh, we'll get to this a bit later. Uh, and it also requires that you define a database, like a username password database, uh, even though it's actually superficial. So you usually just said, if you're using client certificates exclusively, you will simply make sure that uh, it's kind of passed through, that every uh, password that uh, the client uh, provides will actually return a success. Since we are using all the client certificate verification anyway, and we are extracting the username from the certificate itself. The good thing about Docot, uh, I really like the username extraction from the client certificate, and uh, it's nice that it overrides any username that the, user, that the client has provided, and it has support for CRL verifications. The bad thing is that while the password database uh, kind of feels redundant, uh, it's not really necessary, but you still must define something, and uh, it's just a little bit tedious, not, not, nothing too much. And 
you can't use subject alternative names for extracting the username. So if you can put the mail uh, into the certificate subject, uh, you're in a little bit of trouble. Uh, it can't use, for example, the RFC 82 name from, the, uh, from uh, subject alternative name for determining the username. Uh, its certification authority and serial specification is, well, quite terrible. That, that, that's just asking for trouble when you're updating the CRLs. And it has no CSP support. <laughs> I copy pasted that a lot. So, SMTP, uh, I've already suggested Postfix. So, beyond Postfix, you don't need any additional software. Uh, you will need to provide Postfix service certificate in PEM format. It's kind of standard with uh, root and intermediate C certificates, private key in PEM formats, and then you specify the trust chain. Uh, trust chain is specified uh, as a single file, and you must place both root and intermediary certificate authority certificates into it. Uh, you also need to specify to Postfix that it should uh, treat uh, the client pen is to authenticate using uh, the client certificate. It should allow it to automatically relay mail to any destination. Uh, and of course, you must make sure to actually tell Postfix to always require client certificates. The good thing is that it's really a breeze to set up. Uh, you can once you have the key store set up and uh, once you have the trust chain set up. It takes like three or four commands to have the entire thing, con the entire thing configured. And um, Postfix uh, supports the use of client certificates itself for uh, connecting to other mail transfer agents or even mail delivery agents. So it can actually have its own client certificates and client uh, and private keys, which it can be used for authenticating such services. The bad thing, and this is the first piece of software that doesn't have it, no CRL support. Now, Postfix uh, allows use of fingerprint-based allow denial lists. It's like you take a fingerprint of your certificate and you add it to a list, and you can specify whether that list is an allow list or a denial list, which is really silly. I mean, uh, you basically have all that information effectively stored in CRL. Okay, you don't have the fingerprints, but uh, Theoretically, you could set up a script that would uh, manually extract uh, fingerprints from some from a CA database based on serial number specified in the CRL. And of course, it has no OCSP support. So, to conclude this part of the presentation and uh, some of my findings, well, findings, what I have experience with, uh, server certificate support is good. So. If you just want data encryption and the verification of service, you're good to go. It all works well. But client certificate support is not so good. Uh, there's a lot of problems, like uh, in cases of reloading CRLs, you usually need, uh, in many cases, you need to restart service and stuff like that. Uh, OCSP response support is very rare. When it comes down uh, to server-side software, I don't think I've had an opportunity to much to work with anything that supports OCSP. Uh, you have some OCSP responder supporting clients like Thunderbird. Uh, there's a lot of uh, what the heck moments because uh, you end up, like in case of Docker, where you specify serials and CA certificates in the same file, you just have no idea what they were thinking about. And uh, generally, client certificate support feels like a second grade citizen. Uh, it seems that it doesn't seem. It, it simply is the fact that uh, client support for using client certificates for authentication authorization was introduced in all, all of this software um, as a second thought. So you can actually see that in some of the design decisions they made. Uh, some of the necessary improvements that we need when it comes to use of x 3 software would be a more uniform configuration. <coughs> uh, like, you know, support several variants, like I want uh, to be able to provide certificate trust chain in a single file or in cache directory, uh, same for a CRL. Uh, and um, you really, really need, need to have separation between CR, CA and CRL files. Uh, those, in my view, those two directories, if they contain CA and CRL, should be 
separated. Uh, this is in case of, uh, so th th this is mostly based on my experience with open and open VPN. And we actually, mm, it might be a good idea to define some kind of simple open standards which would tell, okay, if your piece of software wants to be, uh, wants to support the standard, it has to provide these uh, configuration options for the certification, uh, for, for use of X59 certificates. Uh, and um, we really need support for all CSP responders. I mean, we're depending completely on CRLs, and uh, when you're trying to deploy uh, use of free software components in, like, if you have uh, 20,000 certificates or even more, uh, if you're issuing uh, identity cards in governments, you will uh, very soon end up having a lot of uh, performance issues because CRLs will grow a lot. Uh, <coughs> we also need, it, it would be nice to have uh, more configurability when it comes down to validation. Uh, what I liked was the way PAMPIC ECSLM got it uh, implemented and I think they got it right. And we need better error logging. Uh, I haven't had a slide about it, but I have been also setting up Kerberos using smart cards for the initial authentication, for the pre-authentication phase. And, uh, Let's say that you, you, if you have some kind of tro pro problem, like uh, you can't specify the, the trust chains properly or something like that, you will get uh, very little useful error messages from Kerberos. Yeah, you can actually get some more messages by compiling the package by hand and uh, by enabling uh, debug support manually. And, uh, well, one of the highlights, I think. Uh, I think that the picture will speak for itself. The <laughs> OpenSSL documentation. Uh, <coughs> as I was working with Docot, and uh, of course I didn't put the email into the subject of certificate. I put it in subject alternative name. I was trying to actually implement a simple patch that would uh, add support for extracting username from subject alternative name. And, uh, well, uh, okay, I went to Google first, like, you know, re uh, OpenSSL reads subject of alternative name from certificate, and of course nothing comes up. Uh, then I tried looking for tutorials for OpenSSL. I think the newest tutorial is from 2005 or 4 from IBM's website, uh, amongst the first hits on Google. Uh, and, uh, okay, so then I started digging through the code. Uh, first I tried to look uh, what functions Docot is using for extracting uh, the username from certificate subject. Uh, I found the op some of the OpenSL functions and they were not documented. Uh, it seems that most tutorials which deal with OpenSL actually only concentrate on the part where you perform um, server clients, uh, SL or TLS handshake, and uh, that's kind of it. Nobody goes into details how to work with certificates, uh, extra extract information from, certi from certificates and use it in some meaningful way. Uh, that concludes basically the presentation, so if anyone has some kind of question, yes? About the open SSL that you just said, I agree with you that documentation is really bad. But I find that looking at the apps directory and the demo directory, there's lots of simple examples that you can follow. But yes, that's not documentation. Yes. Yeah. But it's what I, um, what I tend to do. But it's, the problem is OpenSSL is, uh, uh, I, I don't doubt that it, it is a good uh, crypto library. The problem is that uh, it's used by everyone. And you would expect that you actually have more documentation explaining some features. Okay, even the OpenSSL website says like uh, documentation uh, is incomplete or something like that. <laughs> but uh, I think that if, we are, if everyone is using it, we really need to, to know a little bit more about it. Uh, any other questions? Is anyone from OpenSSL here? Okay. Dare, so Maybe we should have a wiki or something. Yeah. I'll, I'll put some well, stuff. Everyone will contribute. Yeah, I'll put some stuff on it. OK.
it. So uh, I actually have a demo session here, but I'll see if I can manage to get it working in the next five or ten minutes. Okay, but any other questions? Yes. Uh -huh, sorry. Uh, have you tried uh, Ap Apache support for sorry? Apache Web Server? Uh, I, I didn't get to that point yet. Because but there is a OCS, OCSP support, or at least there was a patch. Oh, so it has. That's, that's a good thing. Okay, but, but, but why not using something like S2? You know, take the Unix way that you use one thing for one purpose, if that's you know, all the services you just sell, actually. Yes, but it's, uh, you can't, uh, if you have uh, any kind of start TLS style in its serialization, like in the case of SMTP or IMAC, where you connect the server uh, using plain text and then tell it to initiate the handshake, you can't implement it that way, for example. You can and use totally SSL for SMTP as well. And uh, it, it, can, it can get a bit tedious if you, uh, if you need to, you can't use, uh, if you, for example, if, if you are using a tunnel, you actually need to tell your application to connect to local host. So you 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 use uh, you lose a little bit of uh, uh, configuration readability by that because you you uh, don't know you don't see it at the applications configuration which server is targeting you have to go to the S tunnel to the S tunnel. And of course, with the uh, use S tunnel as well, you use the authorization port, right? So if you, for example, for IMAP, you will need both a client certificate and the username password. Yeah, you will get the certificate. I think I don't know about this. So for, for I mean, you can you can <coughs> give the certificate to the application in an environment variable, and then just parse the certificate, or you know, give reassured environment variables. Would yeah. be nice in theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? So okay. can you use uh, almost everything that you? Uh, Want to use that for everyday life using smart cards now? Mm, nah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare to be honest. Uh, there's a lot of things that work, but uh, I, it's kind of uh, most most things are implemented. Most things are there. It's just uh, we need some small steps to actually make it a little <coughs> bit more user friendly and uh, to make it more easier to configure for a regular user. Okay. So, a little bit of uh, thanks. So, thanks, thanks to Martin Palek for organizing all this. Jean-Michel Porek, who provided me with the uh, free token, and who will provide actually a number of free EPAS 2003 tokens uh, tomorrow. QG uh, from CLIPCA, who reviewed the presentation. Thomas Gustafsson for providing some smart cards and smart readers. And of course, everyone uh, here included the free software community for actually supplying all the modules of the components that I'm working with. Uh, in the end, some links. Some of uh, the clip art book is from the openclipart.org. And uh, this is uh, my web page uh, where I'm actually documenting uh, all the installations I make related to the X-Fargo 9. Uh, 